it has been so enriching actually yeah. for me to be involved with the families. I've, I'm all in. I you know yeah. I do almost 99 percent of my time now is working on autism related stuff. I love this. It's a story of persistence and doggedness <laughs> and not taking no for an answer. Yeah. Which anybody who does our business knows that's that's the only way through. That's you the have only to way be through. Absolutely persistent. Absolutely. David Amaral, welcome Hi, to Rochester. Nice, nice. Thanks so Thanks much for much being for here. Yeah, I want to have a you know a few minutes to chat with you about your thoughts about uh, autism, where we're at in the sure. research field, where we're at, and coming up with new ways to uh, help treat these kids and mm -hmm. to deal with these kids to transition these kids. Sure. So sure. Um, twenty years ago, uh, people would say we'll cure autism right. in twenty years. Right. We don't really say that anymore. Right. Um, where Where are we at? Where are we at in delivering? deliverables yeah. to these kiddos yeah. and their parents. Yeah, it's been an interesting transition. Uh, 20 years ago is about when I started in autism research. I started in it because uh, five groups of uh, five families uh, came to our university, University of California, Davis, and um, wanted to start the MIND Institute, which is Medical Investigation of Neurodevelopmental Disorders. And they wanted us to cure autism uh, because they had uh, uh, children who were very profoundly affected by autism, uh, sleep disorders and gastrointestinal problems, and they wanted those kinds of things to be cured. And in the early years of, of my experience in autism, I, I sort of took their mantra and said, yes, what our mission was was to cure autism. But I think we've wised up a lot, and I think we've wised up in part because there are more and more people who are autistic themselves who have been able to educate us. And I think where we're at now is that uh, autism uh, has a number of uh, impairing conditions associated with it, whether it be uh, anxiety that I'm very interested in trying to understand, uh, or gastrointestinal problems, or sleep disabilities, or even something medical like epilepsy. And I think the field has come to the appreciation that those should be the targets for treatment. We should be trying to uh, to treat these impairing conditions. While we obviously want to provide some social skills training and things like that to allow people to be incorporated into society, I think what we've learned is that we have to be more accepting of the condition. That you know, people with autism uh, historically have done uh, enormously positive things throughout history. And the message should be that, you know, just like anybody else, we want to treat disabilities, but we don't necessarily want to eradicate uh, the good features of autism. So that's, I think, we've gotten a much more mature attitude on what our targets are for autism. Right, right. I like that maturity, exactly. It really, we've had a, a, a real maturation in thinking. Yeah. Now, there are, two, there are two questions that come up every time I give a talk on autism. Sure. My own works in, you know, mm -hmm. related to autism as, as well. Um, the first thing parents ask uh, is, uh, are we, have we seen a massive increase in the incidence of autism? Yeah. Or is it better diagnostic tools? Yeah. Where, are, where are you on that? What's, what's your thinking? If there were a simple way to answer that question, you know, I could say yes or no, if there's been an increase or not been an increase. Um, you know, what's happened is that there's, it's, it's a, again, a much more complicated issue. So one thing is that our views of what autism is have changed over the last 50 years. So uh, when Connor first described autism in the late 1940s, it, it was a seriously debilitating disorder that had certain features. Our definition of what autism is has broadened, so we now consider more and more people. Uh, in fact, nowadays it's not so uncommon for a 50 or 60 year old person to say, you know, I could never figure out why I was different throughout my entire life. Now I appreciate that I have a form of autism, but they weren't diagnosed at three years of age. They just realized that when they were 50 or 60. So I think one factor is that uh, there really has been an increase in um, the, the spectrum, we call it autism spectrum disorder, and the spectrum has broadened, so there's more individuals encompassed under that. I do think uh, beyond that, uh, that there are some biologically reasonable ways to think about, is there an increase in autism? So one of the examples I give is genetics. So we know that a certain portion of autism is caused by um, mutations of certain genes. 
Again, not simple because there's now more than 100 genes that we know are, are involved in risk for autism. Many of these uh, genetic mutations are what's called copy number variations. That means you have too much of the gene or you have too little of the gene. Well, it turns out that people um, have more and more copy number variations of their sperm and their eggs the older they, they get. So we know that there's a very clear link between maternal and paternal age and whether you're going to have a child with autism. And if you just look at the demographics of births in the United States, uh, you know, 50 years ago, uh, people were in their early 20s when they had their first child. Now they're in their 30s when they have their first child. So that's going to increase the number of people with autism simply that because of that genetic you know, characteristic. We don't know how much that contributes to it. People have talked about various other kinds of environmental factors. Um, maternal infection. We in California worry about exposure to pesticides. And at our institute, we have people who've shown that, uh, again, if you have uh, an exposure to certain kinds of pesticides or other environmental toxicants, uh, it can slightly increase your risk of having autism. So to answer your question finally, I think probably the number of people with autism has increased. Um, and it's uh, due to a number of factors. And we really don't understand you know, how those factors all come together. And, and because of all these things that I've mentioned, we don't really know what you know, the numbers were 50 years ago and, and what they are now. But the bottom line, I think, is that when you have one in 60 children in the United States diagnosed with autism, that's an enormous number. Right. And we need to understand what's, you know, what are the causes. And of course, you know, what we're all trying to do is uh, do earlier diagnosis so that we can get kids into earlier treatment so that their quality of life, you know, is, is as good as possible for the rest of their lives. To what extent then is, a, is a better diagnosis and more awareness in the clinical communities playing a role as well in the fact that we now know that one in 60 children is born with autism? That's a big barrier. Yeah, I, I agree. Even though if you're at a place where you have a, uh, you know, well-trained clinician, psychologist, psychiatrist, uh, who knows about autism, they can make a pretty clear diagnosis by 18 months, maybe as old as 24 months. The reality is that in the United States, the diagnosis happens beyond four years of age, right? right? So uh, it's getting better, and, but what we do need is more highly trained clinicians. Uh, and there's a number of st uh, strategies. Uh, there's something called the ECHO Autism Program where uh, places like you know the Mind Institute are actually reaching out to rural practitioners in order to educate them about autism, Very so good. that they can you know make those earlier diagnoses. So I, I do think uh, that you know it's gotten a lot lot better than it was 50 years ago. It can still get much better. Now the other thing, of course, is. Uh, we don't have it yet, but it'd be wonderful if we had a biological marker or markers. I don't think that there's going to be one biological marker right. that's going to detect autism. But, you know, if we could, like phenylketonuria, where you take a little drop of blood when the baby's just a newborn and say, okay, this child <clears throat> has this disorder, um, PKU is actually my poster child for autism. I, I, I don't know if it'll happen, but I'd love to have something like this where um, when you can detect PKU, uh, in a child that's a newborn, simply by changing their diet, you can change the life course of that child from having profound intellectual disability to having a near normal existence right. for the rest of their right. lives, right? So we don't know yet whether uh, by having a, a, a blood test or some other biological marker early in life in autism, we could intervene enough so that we could change the life course right. of that child. That's that's one of my hopes and one of my right. goals and guys that's my a, it's research. a chicken and egg situation until you have that measure yeah to sh to do the very early detection you can't test whether you've ways to to right. change the course that's right that's right and and getting after that i mean uh, you know the, the, you really answered my next question which okay. is you know yeah. uh, where are we at with with uh, developing markers brain imaging of course yeah. is a big big one for you personally and mm -hmm. that, but brain imaging electrophysiological markers for the early detection yeah. of autism. Right now, it's mostly done with neuropsychological evaluations yeah. right? in, yeah. in, in, in youngsters by clinicians. Are That's we, right. Are That's we getting right. close at all? 
I think we are. Uh, there's a lot of tantalizing uh, hints in the in the research uh, arena that uh, you know one or more kinds of efforts will produce biological markers. So, as you said, now you have to do a behavioral uh, test. I, even the best clinicians aren't willing to really make a call until about 18 months. Um, they can tell that maybe there's some danger signs, but they're not saying you know, willing to say this is this is autism. In some cases, um, you know, I think uh, the omics, uh, genomics and metabolomics, we uh, did a study looking at blood samples from young children and um, you end up with uh, thousands and thousands of metabolites. So these are small molecules that are in the blood of the child. And we asked, are there any uh, signatures that are different in the children from typically developing children? And you know, I, I guess the bottom line of that study so far is that there was no one signature that could differentiate all the kids with autism from the kids with who were typically developing. But what we did find was that, and I won't go into the details, but one change in amino acids could actually predict at high reliability 17% of kids with autism. We're working on other changes in metabolites where we now think we can, by adding them together, we can probably detect something like 30% of children with right. autism. So again, I, I think what we've all realized is that there's not gonna be one cause of autism, right. there's many, and there's probably not gonna be one biomarker. There are gonna be many. Uh, one of my former graduate students, Mark Shen, who's now at the University of North Carolina, has continued to pursue uh, an imaging strategy. Uh, we found years ago, almost by accident, that uh, young children that are the brothers or sisters of children with autism, so they have a much higher uh, likelihood of having right. autism, um, they had um, uh, what we called increased extraxial fluid. And that means that if you take an MRI of their brains, the, the fluid in between their brains and their skull was in, enlarged, they had more of this fluid. And so uh, Mark, as part of his thesis, actually measured the amount of extraaxial fluid. And turns out, the amount of that extraaxial fluid at six months of life is a pretty good predictor of whether a child's gonna go on to have autism or not. And we've now confirmed that in children that are three years old, they continue to have that increased extraaxial fluid. So I, th I do think it's, we're getting speak, close. Speak to that, though, because, you know, we, uh, people will want to know, well, why is it important to know at six months? What, what does that, what doors does that open for us? Right. So where, the, where you go from there when you have a diagnosis, uh, you can get children into early interventions as early as 12 months, and it has an enormously beneficial effect on those children. So... Again, the reason we're trying to do everything earlier is that you have this window of opportunity. Um, when a child's born, their brain is about 25% of the size of right. what it will be when they're adult. By the time they're six, it's 95% of the size. And the notion is that um, something happened prenatally uh, that has changed the way the brain is organized, but the brain can adapt, if you, particularly if you have the right interventions. Right. So by getting the child into intervention at 12 months rather than, say, at four years or five years or six years, it's much more likely, and there's, there's, there are data on this now, that the earlier you get children into intervention, the more likely you are to show a positive benefit to right. that child. Uh, another thing that I've matured on is that w when I used to write papers about autism, I would say autism is a lifelong disorder. It turns out not necessarily to be the case. So many children who are, in fact, in our own studies, we've shown that many children who are diagnosed at two or three with autism, by the time they're six, have lost the features that would lead to a diagnosis. Right. Right. Uh, we have a colleague at the University of Connecticut. Her name is Dr. Deborah Fine. She's coined the term optimal outcome. Um, but to me, it, what it means is that there's enormous potential for uh, plasticity in the brain at those early ages. And if you can intervene and allow a child who would have had, again, a very serious form of autism, to have a form of autism that can be managed through other processes, right, exactly. that child may go on to college and have a family and you know just have a normal life. So right. that's why we want to get in early and intensively. Yeah, yeah.
And I think that's, that's a really key message because of course, uh, for a parent of a six month old, you know, having their child labeled with a diagnosis yeah. uh, like autism is a painful and difficult time. But the point is that this gives clinicians and researchers a huge window to make, to change the course of a life. Uh, Very of well said. Yep. Now, <clears throat> I would be remiss, and I know everybody who works in the autism field hates mm. this question because uh -huh. we're uh -huh. tired of answering it, but I would uh -huh. be remiss if I didn't ask you to give us 20 or 30 seconds on vaccines. We're sitting in the middle of another uh, measles crisis of all things in the US at the moment. Yeah. So give us, tell, us, <clears throat> tell us where you're at with that. Well, I, I really hardened on this. I think, uh, first of all, there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever that vaccines cause autism, particularly the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine that, that we're here most about. Um, the notion that it causes autism uh, came from a flawed and now retracted paper uh, and uh, unfortunately, humans are, tend to be superstitious. So when they hear something concrete, they tend to buy into it. And it's hard to change people's minds. And on the other hand, I think people are looking for an answer. You know, we scientists at this point are still struggling to say, you know, what caused your child's autism? And we can't give a straightforward answer. But I've really looked at the data on, on whether the MMR vaccine uh, can cause autism. And you know there have been papers and papers and papers showing that uh, you know, both in the United States and other countries, if you look at uh, all of the uh, epidemiological data, there was a meta-analysis that was done just last year based on 15 million children, right? right? 15 million. Now, if, you, if there was any signal whatsoever, if there was any indication, even a minimal risk that the MMR vaccine would cause autism, you would have seen it in that analysis, but there, there just wasn't. Right. And so the tragedy is that uh, measles is a devastating illness to some children. Uh, when I was uh, in San Diego, we had a neighbor who child, whose child uh, contracted measles and then ended up with measles encephalitis and died uh, when they were six. Uh, this is a preventable uh, disease. And I think um, with more and more children having measles, there's going to be more death, there's going to be more disability, and it's entirely preventable. And I'll tell you, one of the things that convinced me in my own research that you know probably we shouldn't be even worrying about the MMR vaccine is that I've become convinced that everything that probably leads to autism happens prenatally, long before the child has the vaccines. The reason that a lot of parents think that the vaccines might be related to autism is that you have the MMR vaccines at 12 months and 24 months, right? And so there are two, I'm gonna simplify, but there's basically two forms of autism, how it starts. In one form, the child, even when they're really young, like 12 months, you know something's wrong. Right. And they're not making eye contact. They're really, you know, this is based on on really good research that w looked at uh, first birthday videotapes and quantified how much time the child is enjoying the party, making contact. And so we call that early onset autism. But then there's another group of kids, and it's about 50-50. Uh, again, I'm oversimplifying, but it's about 50-50. Right. Um, that at 12 months of life, you look at them, they're smiling, they're enjoying things, they're learning, you know, beginning to learn words. Uh, for all practical purposes, they look you know, essentially uh, typical in right. terms of their development. And then something happens between 18 and 24 months, uh, and they regress into autism, right? And so occasionally, a child will have the MMR vaccine and then that regression will take place. And there's an association then between the vaccine and the, and the, the onset of the autism. But um, it's, it's correlation, it's not causation. And so we did a study where we tracked young kids essentially from birth and we've, we're following them now, they're in middle childhood. Uh, and we were able to look at their head circumference sizes, which is a proxy to their, their, their brain size. What we know and our research shows is that um, there's a subset of children that have increased head circumference uh, and then increased brain size. And so we looked at whether we could detect that, when we could detect that in kids who had regressive form of autism. It turns out that the brains of the children 
were starting to change at four to six months after birth, okay? Long before they even had the first MMR vaccine, but they had regressive form of autism. Right. So this is another thing we've learned is that a lot of neurodevelopmental disorders happen early on, but there's no signs and symptoms of it until much later on. Even nowadays, my, my colleagues who study schizophrenia call schizophrenia a neurodevelopmental disorder right. because they think it's something that happened you know, prenatally or really early on, but you don't see the schizophrenia until 20 or 30 years later, right? right? right. So again, the bottom line <laughs> is that I don't think uh, you know, the MMR vaccine has anything to do with the onset of autism. And uh, I think if parents don't become aware and public policy doesn't become more aware that it's, it's just not okay to vac not vaccinate your children because you're not only affecting your child, you're affecting everybody else in the community. And I think we have to have some social awareness and social consciousness yeah, that yeah. this is you know, important, not only for our family, but you know, the larger family of people. Right. I grew up in, in Ireland and uh, the MMR vaccine hadn't reached the countryside. So mm. we, in my own family, we, I have a profoundly deaf cousin as a result of rubella, right. measles and, right. and so on. Yeah, so I mean, right. we, and you see the devastation that right. something as simple as measles yeah. can, can wreak. Everywhere you look at it, yeah. I think, yeah. you know, vaccines are one of the, I think, wonders of, of medical science. Yeah, yeah and, and I do think, you know, there's something, I, and I don't quite understand this. I think sociologists and others need to be able to explain this better. There, there is a certain reluctance on the part of the public to believe uh, medical science and believe people like us, you mm -hmm, know? Mm -hmm. And I think we have to do better to educate people, you know, and, and, and inspire confidence in them. It's, yeah. you know, we're, we've long gone past Marcus Welby and, you know, <laughs> some of these right. American doctors who were so well, well I, I think, of. you know, it's a, we ha as a field, we have a communication problem. And maybe, yeah. you know, I, maybe it's an old trope, but, but uh, you know, scientists, we're busy in the lab. We're maybe not the most social people in the world. Yeah. So that's why I'm glad you're here on camera with us today. Good. You couldn't have possibly said that any clearer. Thanks Good. for doing that. Dave. Okay, thanks. But let's stay with controversy. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Good. We're not going to let you off the hook there. Yeah. Speak to the people uh, who are watching in about uh, the key importance of animal models in research, uh, and particularly around autism. I think, uh, on the one hand, uh, the best model for studying autism is people with autism, yeah, autistic absolutely. people. But uh, when we're trying to get to the point of understanding the mechanisms for what's causing uh, autism, it's it really hard and, and, of course, unethical to try and do the studies that need to be done in uh, human subjects. So I'll give you an example. Um, uh, I, I mentioned that some of our research points to the fact that uh, a subset of children uh, with autism have big brains. And it turns out that it's 15% of boys who have autism have really enlarged brains. We call it megalencephaly. In our study, we found that these kids tend to have even more intervention because they're doing so poorly than the kids who are you know, doing better, uh, but they just don't respond. And so the question is, why? Maybe if we understood why their brains are enlarged or what's going on in their brains, uh, we, you know, we could maybe have an answer to a medical intervention or something else that could be helping. Well, we don't understand why their brains are larger. We, we don't understand whether they have too many neurons, whether they have too many connections. And I do a lot of MRI and we've really probed these kids with our MRI, but MRI can only get you down to a certain level. It's like looking at the earth from 30,000 feet. Uh, you can't see an individual tree, or you can't see a rose on a bush, and we really need to be able to understand um, these kids at a cellular level. So we and others are trying to create animal models of this phenomenon mm -hmm. so that we can under understand the basic molecular mechanisms neurobiological mechanisms. So hopefully that'll give us a hint as to a more effective treatment. I think it's perfectly ethical to try and understand a human disease by, uh, you know, humanely, ethically, and, you know, uh, do studies in, in, in animal models. I'm a strong proponent of only doing what makes sense and, and not, you know, certainly not do wasteful animal mm -hmm. research. 
you know, things like testing drugs. You don't want to test drugs on people. You want to test drugs on, uh, you know, on either animal models or another bioassay. And you know, having said that, while I feel it's perfectly appropriate, I do think that science is moving forward with some really intriguing new strategies that is going to reduce the number of animals. So uh, when I was a graduate student here, the idea that I could take a few of your skin cells and turn them into your neurons which was completely science fiction, right? We're doing that now at the Mind Institute where we bring in the children, particularly these children with the big brains. We take, actually we don't even have to take their skin cells, we just take a little blood sample and then our colleagues are transforming them into what are called induced pluripotent stem cells and then transforming those into neurons and glial cells and all the parts of the brain. And we're able to understand you know, what may or may not be different in the regulatory processes in those neurons. And then, like other forms of science, we could take potential drugs of treatment, squirt them on the neurons in a dish to see if they normalize whatever's wrong with those neurons right. before we squirt them into the child, right? I think as long as we need animal models, it's perfectly appropriate. I do hope that we will continue to get more advanced uh, other assays that will reduce the amount of animal usage to you know what is absolutely essential. Yeah, of course. Policy. Yeah. Let's okay. turn to policy. Yeah. In the morning, we're going to assign you as the NIH czar for autism research. Yeah. What would you do to shake up the field? Are we doing it? Are we doing it the right way right now? Is it all working uh, as best it can be? Yeah. Or are there things that we could do as a field, as a, as a, as a community, that would really uh, you know, break the back of this thing? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's, again, a really hard one to answer. Right. So I sit on a committee called the Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee. What is clear is that your autism still is in... Um, you know, sort of deficit of in terms of the resources that are needed to do what needs to be done. So we recommended last year that the amount of the amount of money that goes into autism research annually now is about three hundred and fifty million dollars. The IACC recommended that it be doubled. Now, uh, so the first thing I would do is I would try and put more money into autism research because I think. Uh, it's not the case that it were saturated with good science. That there mm -hmm. is a lot of good science um, that not getting it, done that's not getting of the done. Lack of funding. Exactly, yeah. that we don't have the funding. And you know, the other thing is that I think not all autism research can be done in a standard five-year grant cycle. So one of the things that we've done is we we're trying to do a longitudinal analysis of children with autism, uh, and. You know, we've been fortunate that we've gotten different kinds of NIH funding, and now we have an Autism Center of Excellence that's funding that. But it, it really was uh, uh, a lot of work <laughs> to try and hobble together all of the funding necessary to, we have now over 500 families that are involved in this project. And, and you know, it would be so much nicer if, um, if there would have been a, a, a project, maybe a, even a multi-site project, they would have said, okay, we want to understand the life history of autism. So we're going to start with, with families that are thinking about having a child, take blood samples from the mom, from the dad, understand the genetics, do sampling through prenatal life so we understand whether there were any medical problems with the pregnancy, and then start analyzing maybe annually the child as they grow up. Uh, to really try and, number one, parse autism into more homogeneous subtypes, but really to understand, you know, what are the causes, you know, prenatally that affect things postnatally. Th there's no study in the United States going on like that. Right. Uh, there are environmental studies there are, that are pretty big. There's genetic studies that are pretty big, but there's no environmental studies that are hooked to genetic studies, and right. neither of those are hooked to imaging studies. So, so I'll tell you one other thing. We were talking about animal models before, and uh, I... And so I think uh, that for some of the studies that we're going to want to do in the future, um, to uh, most of the research is being done on mice, and, and that makes sense. Uh, mice are a reasonable proxy for certain aspects of our biology. But um, uh, for certain other things, uh, the non-human primate is going to be the only reasonable proxy for, particularly for um, 
interest in understanding social impairments and cognitive impairments. I think we're, we're going to have to do at least some work on the non-human primate, and particularly to understand how the genes that have been linked to autism you know, produce autism and what are the brain changes that those genes uh, bring about. Our colleagues in Japan and China have realized that this is probably going to be the future of biomedical research and have invested heavily in transgenic models in, in the non-human primate. Uh, for the, probably for the last you know, 10 years. And they are actually leading us by mm -hmm. far on, in this area. Uh, the NIH has been slower to, uh, uh, to embrace the notion that we can do genetic models, even though you hear in the news nowadays that people are worried about whether there's going to be genetic models you know, using this so-called CRISPR-Cas technique, which is actually a pretty straightforward and exciting yeah. technique. They're actually to, take, gene editing to, to do gene right, Jack, editing. Right, yeah, right. people are worried about whether they're going to gene edit people. Right. You know, and I, which I agree. I don't. You know, I, I think we need to put the brakes on that right now. Absolutely. But but that technique could actually be used in non-human primates to create. I think you know again in a in a in a, in a reasonable and ethical way some very useful non-human primate models of autism. It's happening in other countries, it's not happening in the United mm -hmm. States. So again, if I could wake up and change something at the NIH, Wave that sort of, yeah. <laughs> so to say, let's get, get on with that as well. When you were nine or 10, year old, 10 years old yourself, yeah. d did you know you were going to be a neuroscientist? Did you ever think you'd be uh, in this position? Uh, is that, was that the dream? Uh, you know, I was always pretty much a nerd. Um, not a neuroscientist. Um, I, I was always interested in the issue of social behavior. In my high school, late high school years and uh, early college years, I was really a big fan of B.F. Skinner, uh, you know, psychologist who um, developed a lot of the behavioral strategies that ultimately were used in some of the intervention techniques in autism. I, I once wrote to B.F. Skinner and got a note back, which was really one of the highlights of my teen Is it years. In a frame on your yeah, wall? Yeah, I, I have it at home. I have it at home <laughs> that I haven't, I haven't lost. Uh, and he wrote a book called Walden Two, where um, basically through um, you know through use of operant conditioning techniques, it was a utopia, and you know everybody got along. Of course, it, it so, sort of did fall apart, and there were some models that tried to do that and, and, and were more complicated than just what learning techniques can, can try and control. <clears throat> but um, I guess I was always thinking that I would go into some form of biology at some point in time and uh, really got interested in it uh, when I went to Northwestern as an undergraduate. Had a terrific um, uh, faculty um, a psychology faculty member whose name is Arya Rutenberg, who's uh, unfortunately passed recently. And uh, <clears throat> he, he uh, taught uh, the introduction to brain and behavior and uh, went to that course. Uh, and uh, it, it just like, oh, so, you know, there was always something missing about B.F. Skinner because Skinner was only the psychology, but I always wondered, so, you know, what is it that's causing this? You know, mm -hmm. the, and, and Skinner, for him, it, the brain was a black box. He didn't care about it. But clearly that was where all the really cool stuff was happening. And if you could only understand the brain, you know, you'd really be able to, uh, you know, modify behavior and, and hopefully, you know, help people. Uh, and so when I went to this course uh, by Dr. Rutenberg, uh, it was like, oh, this this is really it, and um, this is my playground. This is my playground, and and I, I almost immediately I went to uh, this is my sophomore year in Northwestern, and I went to uh, to to Arye and and said I wanted to work in his laboratory, and uh, he said no. <laughs> I, you know, <laughs> I, you know, my parents are paying for me to go to Northwestern. I want to work in your laboratory, and and he said no. So I. You know, at the time I was sort of persistent, and I, I uh, went back to him again, and uh, I'd love to, you know, I'll, I'll volunteer to work in your laboratory. And he said no. <laughs> so, and I, I went back a third time, and uh, and so we're, I can remember we were sitting in a microscopy room together, and he said, "Okay, you took my course. Um, tell me how the cerebellum works." <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, geez, I, I don't really know. <laughs> you know. I knew the platitudes about the cerebellum, right? And he said, and, and fortunately, I said, you know, I really don't know. And he said, okay, 
Uh, as long as you didn't BS me and tell me some you know myth about the cerebellum, I'm going to let you work with me. And that was it. Was like you know oh, he, you what he, the he, he passed a litmus test, and he wanted to know whether I was going to be persistent enough. That was the beginning of my career, and I I went from there to here, yeah. University of Rochester as a graduate student, and uh, haven't looked back. I think in my early career, uh, you know, the first 20 years or so. Uh, I was doing really basic science, trying to understand the circuitry of the brain and the function of the brain. I was very interested in memory and in uh, uh, emotion and social behavior, worked on parts of the brain that we thought, we think, uh, are involved in that, uh, and really wasn't all that interested in clinical research, uh, per se, until the parents who wanted to start the Mind Institute uh, came to us, and, um, you know, I, I just was so empathetic with, you know, the really difficult life they have. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's what a lot of people don't understand is that many children with autism, you know, they have a sleep problem. What's the sleep problem? They don't. Mm -hmm. They don't sleep. So, right. you know, three of the families that started out of the five that started um, the Mind Institute, their children would sleep about an hour and a half a night. So, uh, you know, imagine what this, that does, you know, to a family life, to marriage life, mm -hmm. you know, it, and, and their kids would just take off. They, they, you know, they would try and leave the house, and so they always had to be mon monitoring the children, you know, all the time. Uh, their kids had GI problems, so you know they, they, they could just not have a normal family meal, and uh, you know, so and it, it seemed to me that you know this is something that, you know, potentially could impact the family and the child for the remainder yeah, of their it's, lives. It's relentless. The it's task relentless. in front of parents it, and exactly. siblings and the child itself. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So finally, I, I, you know, it, it uh, tickled my empathy, yeah. uh, and, uh, and you relented, and I relented, yeah. and I, I. It has been so enriching, actually, yeah. for me to be involved with the families. I've, I'm all in. I, you know, yeah. I do almost 99 percent of my time now is working on autism-related stuff. That's great. I love this. It's a story of persistence and doggedness <laughs> and not taking no for an answer, yeah. which anybody who does our business knows that's, that's the only way through. That's you the have only to be way absolutely through. Absolutely persistent. Absolutely. Last question. Okay. When you're not, when you don't have your science hat on, you, you're yeah. a self admitted nerd. Yeah. What do you do? What's, what, what floats your boat? I'll say three, three things. I, I love spending time with my wife and, uh, we have a golden retriever dog, and so taking walks with them, you know, that, that's just sort of the, part of the relaxation. Uh, one of the things that um, uh, I'm just getting back into is music. When I, went to, uh, uh, when I went to Northwestern, for a while there, I was toying with the idea of either going into music or, or going into science. Uh, and I, I fortunately met a lot of the musicians because I was taking the music courses and they were so much superior to me in every respect in terms of music and decided it's probably easier to, be, to go into <laughs> science, so I did, I did that. Yeah. But uh, I, I taught guitar and played guitar when I was at Northwestern and, uh, um, and, and subsequently I sort of got away from it, but I just, uh, just actually this year bought myself a, a brand new guitar, which I love, and I've been playing some sort of more of that. Uh, Amazing how yeah. many people in the sciences are musicians as well, that they, it, it gives them that creative output because there's, it can be a slog in science. Yeah. And so to get home and to work on a piece of music is, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. that creativity as well. It's that absolutely true. crosses the two disciplines. So music is one thing, and I guess the, the last thing that... Uh, um, is I like the ocean. Uh, I was born in Massachusetts, and uh, uh, we have a little house out on Cape Cod. It, you know, it might be, sound crazy that we, we live in California, but we go to Cape Cod for the summer. But it's like sort of like a lemming going to the sea. You know, I, I imprinted on the even the stinky smells of the ocean. You know, just and and I we my wife and I and the dog often uh, spend time on the on the East Coast. And you know, the antithesis to um, to the the academia or the the science where you're all constantly thinking, t constantly worrying about your next grant and things like that, is that uh, I go out and I go clamming, which means I take a rake, I go in about a foot of water, and I, <laughs> like a farmer, <laughs> go out there looking for cohogs. And it, you know, and the nice thing is that you get better at it over time, and right. so I get enough. So and this I can gives eat you peace. Them. And this, yeah. So you get out there, you know, six thirty in the morning, and the seagulls are flying over and it's a sunny day and the boats are going out and you know it's just completely peaceful so when when you know i'm worrying about a grant sometimes i'm thinking about <laughs> doing that cohogging but um, i am 
very passionate about the science that we do. We have a tremendous team of people. That's, you know, it, all of the stuff that I've talked about that I say we do at the Mind Institute really is based on a group of, of people that are contributing in different ways. And, and it's a very exciting time. I'm very optimistic. I, I know that families uh, who have children with autism are, you know, constantly saying, you know, how come we don't have an answer? And, and I think, you know, it, it's because the question is so difficult. Mm -hmm. I mean, autism is really complicated, difficult to understand disorder. But we are making, uh, we are improving, we are, um, you know, making progress. And, and I do think that, um, you know, as we focus more and more, as we talked about at the very beginning, on trying to treat things like anxiety and epilepsy right. and GI, you know, we may not solve the entire problem. Right. And, and again, as we talked about in the very beginning, maybe that's not, shouldn't be the goal. Maybe, you know, to have an autistic person who, you know, is not no longer anxious or no longer right. has the threat of an epilepsy, uh, that that's fine. Yeah. Then we, we declare victory and, and move on. I often say that to parents, we would love to throw a 90 yard touchdown. Yes. But we're doing it inches a foot, a yard at a time, yep. but we are making progress. We are, we are. David Amaral, thanks for being here at the Del Monte Institute. Welcome home to no, the University you. of thank Rochester. You. I enjoyed it, thanks very much.